And at this point, I will um, officially welcome our guest, who is Ryan Mulhall, the uh, Chief Information Officer for the Iowa Communications Network, who is here today to talk us through a cybersecurity incident response plan that is available to you guys through the ICN or Iowa Communications Network. And um, I would like to say that we did post this template plan in Iowa Learns as an attachment on this course. So if you have Iowa Learns up and you're on your dashboard, um, you should see this class listed in your My Task list, and there'll be an attachment icon there. You can grab it out of that attachments um, area, as well as a copy of the slides um, for today's workshop as well. So you do currently have access to both of those things, and they will be made available with the recording as well. So, um, Ryan, is there anything else you'd like me to say by way of introduction? Otherwise, I'll turn the floor over to you. I'll leave mine off until we get yours working. I think that works great for me. Uh, All right, awesome. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, like Sam said, I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer here at the Iowa Communications Network. I've been here for about seven years, and we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today about uh, this important cybersecurity topic, um, and that is, of course, incident response. So I love the title. Our great marketing lead, uh, Lori Larson, came up with for this webinar. Because uh, noticing something is amiss is just kind of the start of of what you need to do, and uh, you know, so our depending on how mature your security operations and your talent is, uh, sometimes they'll say you don't want to unplug it right away because you can glean so much information. Our security lead, uh, yes, definitely likes to leave things plugged in if uh, if something happens, so you can gather all the the data and everything he needs to do that appropriate incident response. So we're going to walk through some uh, the current threat landscape, some common attack vectors and what to do, of course, when that inevitable happens and we're dealing with a cybersecurity incident. And like Sam and, touched uh, on. Ryan, I don't know if, are you intending, if you, I, you may present with your camera off if you like to, but just a heads up that your camera is not on, but. Yes, I'm gonna present with it off. I'll turn it on when the Q and A starts. Sounds fine. Uh, and like Sam touched on, the most important thing we want you to take away from this is that sample incident response plan, uh, where you can kind of fill in the blanks and tailor it to your organization. and. You know, in a very short amount of time, five to 10 minutes, you can have a fully functional incident response plan and know what to do and who to call. So let's jump on in. Maybe not. There we go. All right. So for those that don't know, the ICN, we're the state-owned fiber network, broadband carrier, and internet service provider. Uh, we are officed on the, uh, in the Grimes building on the Capitol Complex. We have a 24 by 7 network operations center at Joint Forces headquarters in Johnston. We have about 68 full-time staff plus another 50 or so contractors that uh, we work with all across the state to provide our services. And we are celebrating our 30th year service. We have a lot of great information on our past, uh, our present, and our future. Uh, so we'd love for you to scan our QR code and, and take a look. And I promise it isn't a trick or some kind of security test. It is the actual functioning QR code. So the ICN started as a two-way interactive video network for education to share resources uh, that 30 years ago, and we've evolved into what we are today. So notice that video is nowhere in the picture on the services we provide anymore. Uh, we've added quite a few more services over the last couple of years, including uh, DDoS attack mitigation, managed firewall, uh, direct connects to cloud providers like AWS, Google, Azure, and hundreds more as people uh, start to migrate more and more to the cloud and co-location at our uh, secure facilities. That's just a good uh, visual of how big and vast our network is. I think we're, we probably are the, uh, we know we are the only uh, state that has a network broadband or designated as a broadband carrier by the FCC. And I, I, we don't think that anybody has as much owned assets uh, across the country as we do. So by code, we can only serve the education, healthcare, state and federal government and public safety entities. Uh, we do have a couple exceptions to serve local governments with of course, uh, you all libraries being one of them. Uh, I met the state librarian, Michael Scott, at a broadband event put on by the OCIO 
a month or two ago and uh, was really impressed hearing some of the stories and the ways that you guys are all using technology to serve your citizens. So keep up the great work in that arena and we're glad to help you play a small part in that for those that are customers. Uh, jumping into cybersecurity here at the state of Iowa. So in December of 2015, then Governor Branstad issued Executive Order 87 that tasked the Office of the Chief Information Officer, the ICN, Department of Public Safety, Homeland Security, and the National Guard with drafting a cyber plan for the state of Iowa. Uh, been through a couple uh, iterations of that plan and expect that will be refreshed again in the very near future, uh, as that is one of the uh, State Chief Information Security Officer, Shane Dwyer, uh, as priorities. Uh, one of the things we also do is uh, I serve as a lobbyist for our agency uh, over at the Capitol and get to spend a lot of time over there, especially this time of year. Cybersecurity has definitely been a priority over the last couple of years and focus for the governor's office eh, as well as both the Senate and the House. So we've seen some legislation pass already, uh, including data privacy legislation. We're now one of only six states with something on the books on that topic, and there may be some more signed as they head up, uh, as they head towards likely finishing this week, fingers crossed. So what is cybersecurity? I mean, the, the definition is just the art of protecting networks, devices, data from unauthorized access or criminal use, and the practice of ensuring uh, what we call the CIA, CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity and availability of information or network. I like to boil it down to really two things, uh, you know, visibility and risk. You want as much as the former and as little as the latter as possible. And that should, uh, should guide any kind of cybersecurity program that you're looking to do. So this is just a, a risk matrix that uh, kind of shows when you're planning and assessing risk, uh, you're measuring two things there, the likelihood of something happening and the impact of when it if and when it does. So you can have, you know, no risk, low risk, medium, high or critical. So, um, you know, if you determine that there's no risk, there'd be no effect to the organization's ability to provide uh, services to users, low, uh, just a minimal effect. The organization can still provide all those critical services to the users. You lose a little bit of efficiency. A medium organization loses the ability to provide the critical service to a subset of system users and high uh, critical would, of course, no longer be able to provide uh, some or all those critical services that are dependent on technology. Incident response, or IR, is taking the measures and steps to overcome a security breach or cyber attack. The goal of IR is simply to limit damage or downtime and then recover as quickly and cost effectively as possible in the event of that security breach or cyber attack. Uh, these are just a couple of resources uh, that are out there when uh, looking at incident response and putting together your policy plans, procedures, uh, NIST, uh, National Institute St of Standards and Technologies, uh, special publication 800-61. Uh, U.S. CERT puts out a computer security incident handling guide. Uh, Iowa Code 715C, uh, the Attorney General's Office gives the guidance on uh, specific security breach uh, protocols here in the state of Iowa. And then of course, what we'll go over later is the sample incident response plan and procedures. So when you're establishing your IR capability, uh, formally, you just wanna be prepared to respond quickly and effectively when that uh, some uh, security uh, breach potentially happens. So uh, you wanna create an incident response policy and that is the foundation of your program. So it defines which events are considered incidents, establishes that organizational structure for incident response, defines roles and responsibilities, uh, list requirements for reporting incidents and anything to really guide, guide the program. And then after that, you wanna develop that incident response plan uh, based on the policy. So it provides the roadmap for implementing the incident response program based on that policy. So uh, you should have short and long-term goals, including metrics for measuring the program. It should also include how often incident handlers should be trained and requirements for incident handlers. And then the procedures need to be developed as well. So uh, kind of we're going to kind of go over a hybrid of a response and procedures uh, but that provides the detailed steps for responding to an incident. It should cover all the phases of the incident response process, 
And those procedures should be based on, of course, the incident response policy and plan. Uh, one of the things that you want to have in there as well is the uh, communication and incident uh, related information sharing. So uh, that would be with outside parties such as media, law enforcement, uh, and any other kind of incident reporting organization. Um, so when you're putting this stuff together, you kind of want to consider the relevant factors uh, when selecting an incident response team model. So you should carefully kind of weigh the disadvantages and advantages of each possible stream uh, team structure uh, to make sure that the organization's needs, as well as people have the time and their available resources. Um, if it's a, is it all hands on deck, is it you know a, a temporary duty? Is there somebody who's designated as the primary? Those are the kinds of things that you kind of want to touch on when establishing your capability. Uh, prevention is still key. Um, you know, obviously, um, organizations should reduce uh, incidents as much as you can by effectively securing network systems and applications, uh, making sure that you're doing some of those uh, activities like risk assessments. So periodic risk assessments of <laughs> so systems and applications can uh, help you determine what risks are posed by uh, what you have versus the common uh, threats and vulnerabilities that may be specific to what's in your environment. And that should include uh, prioritizing risks and making sure that MIS can be mitigated, transferred, or accepted uh, until controls are put in place and you can reach that overall acceptable level of risk uh, for the business. Uh, host security. So all of your uh, computers, servers, laptops, desktops, what have you, uh, they should be hardened appropriately using standard configurations. Uh, and then also you want to keep them properly patched and, uh, you know, you want to use that uh, principle of least privilege, if you heard that before, that's granting users only the privileges necessary for performing their authorized tasks. And they should have, those hosts uh, should have auditing enabled and should log, uh, if you can't log all events, you should at least be able to log uh, significant security related events. Uh, malware prevention uh, or endpoint protection prevention, as, as it might be called now, EDR. So that's software to detect and stop uh, malware or other malicious software uh, that should be deployed everywhere across the organization on your, uh, again, those end user machines, servers, the likes, anywhere that can take a, a software like that should have it on there. Um, as well as application servers, like email servers, web pro pro proxies and the like. And then one of the most important things uh, you always hear is user awareness and training. So uh, your users should be made aware of policies and procedures regarding the appropriate use of those network systems and applications. And then, uh, you know, if there's any kind of lessons learned in any event or information sharing from previous incidents, make sure that users uh, and their organizations know so they can see how their actions could ultimately affect the organization. And, just basically improving the user awareness regarding incidents should reduce the frequency of incidents. Most of the stuff you see in numbers, you see about 90% of any kind of breach uh, security incident starts with a phishing email these days. So, uh, you know, your users can be your best sensors as they will know potentially something's amiss if they're receiving their email inbox or their system's not working uh, as it used to or correctly. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, your first line of defense and somebody and people you want to include. Some of the common attack vectors that are out there, uh, you know, organizations should be prepared to handle any, any incident, but uh, you know, you do need to focus on, uh, I think the common attack vectors, you can't plan and prepare for every incident, but kind of having a shell and baseline for some of the common ones can guide you in almost anything that comes your way. So they, these incident occurs in countless ways uh, so, you, you know, developing step-by-step -step instructions for handling every incident is not feasible. But some of those common attack vectors you see out there, um, flash drives, CDs, uh, peripheral device like a uh, external hard drive, uh, you know, those are usually not, uh, not good things uh, to be floating around. People like to plug them in without uh, knowing what's on there, and people are curious. Uh, attrition, that's an attack that employs brute force, brute force methods to compromise, degrade, or destroy systems, networks, or services. So that'd be 
uh, trying to hack a password using a brute force method, uh, DDoS attack and things like that. Uh, email, obviously attacks can be executed via email messages or attachments, links uh, within those email uh, improper usage. So that'd be an incident resulting from violation of an organization's acceptable use, pos use policies. Uh, you can have a firewall and have all those things uh, tuned to block stuff, but things can still get through. So users, um, you know, not stepping outside the bounds, uh, definitely something to watch for as well and something you want to monitor. Uh, loss or theft of equipment, uh, that kind of speaks for itself. Hopefully, most everybody's using some kind of encryption these days. So even if it is lost or stolen, uh, people won't be able to get on there and access it anyway. All right, so a quick uh, just events versus incidents. So in events and is an observable occurrence in a system or, or network events include uh, things like somebody connecting to a file share or server receives a request uh, for a web page, user sends an email, a firewall blocks a connection attempt. Uh, you know, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions potentially potential events on a network each day, depending on the size. So uh, you want to, not every uh, event is an incident and like uh, likewise, but a security incident is that violation or imminent threat of violation of those computer security, computer security policies, uh, acceptable use policies, or standard security practices. So, uh, some examples of an incident would be an attacker uh, is using a botnet to send high volumes of connection requests to a web server, causing it to crash. Well, that's your standard kind of DDoS attack. Uh, users get tricked into open an attachment sent via email uh, that actually turns out uh, to be malware, ransomware, the like, and now their computer is infected and is now established connection with an external host. Uh, disgruntled user provides or exposes uh, sensitive information to others. Um, that's kind of the... Uh, the impetus of why you want to have good onboarding and offboarding procedures, uh, especially, you know, if somebody's fired, you want to make sure that as quickly as possible that you're uh, taking their network access away, making sure that they are not able to potentially steal or take with them any uh, company sensitive data. All right, so communications. Uh, these are the things, kind of the external parties that you want to uh, think about and include when it comes to the uh, incident response. So um, one of the things we touched on, obviously, being an ISP, um, you know, your upstream ISP may be able to help block a major network-based attack or trace its origin. Uh, we see uh, we have a very, very unique view into uh, traffic uh, here in the state, especially for those entities that we serve. Uh, and we are able to see a lot of different uh, things and we can get a good idea of where it's going and where it's coming from. Hopefully we can't, uh, you know, get in there and, and look at it because it's encrypted, but we can definitely help uh, if need be. Uh, the owners of attacking addresses. So if uh, they're originated from an external organization's IP address space, uh, you know, you can go out uh, there's places on the web you can look to find, uh, like Aaron being one of them, the American Registry of Internet Numbers. Uh, you can find the designated security contacts for those organizations, alert them to any activity, uh, ask them to help with evidence, and then uh, software vendors. So, uh, you know, software or hardware vendors. So uh, these contacts, uh, you can have questions regarding significance of um, you know, any traffic or log entries that uh, you need help with. And uh, more importantly, most of the time, those companies uh, keep, uh, you know, those software vulnerabilities uh, warehoused and keep people apprised of them. So, you know, when to patch and they might be able to provide information on some of those zero day attacks or new threats. And then again, continue to help you understand that current threat environment. Law enforcement agencies, um, one reason many security related incidents do not result in convictions is that some organizations uh, don't properly contact law enforcement uh, for many reasons. Uh, but there are several levels of law enforcement that are available to help investigate incidents or if nothing else, at least collect that information and be able to correlate it to other stuff. So 
Uh, within the U.S., you got federal investiga investigatory agencies, uh, the FBI kind of being the primary one that takes on cybersecurity issues, uh, district attorney offices, uh, state law enforcement here uh, has a cyber and intelligence capability, uh, as well as local county law enforcement. Now, they might not be able to help you, but again, uh, with that incident response, but at least having them aware and in part of your plan uh, with uh, that information, they, again, can uh, sometimes help you depending on if it's big enough or, again, they can just correlate that data and be able to use it in a broader case and hopefully get more of these cyber criminals off the streets. So when it comes to incident response itself, there are several phases. Uh, the initial phase um, is preparation. So that's establishing and training an incident response team and acquiring the necessary tools and resources. So during this phase, uh, you know, we want to also attempt to limit the number of incidents that occur by selecting and implementing, uh, you know, those controls based on the results of risk assessments. Uh, you know, there will always be residual, residual risk uh, that inevitably persists after any controls are implemented. So then the detection of any of those security breaches is necessary to alert the organization whenever uh, any possible incidents occur. So in keeping with the severity of the incident, the organization can mitigate the impact by containing it and ultimately recovering from it. Uh, during the prep phase, activity often cycles back to detection analysis. For example, uh, you know, if you see additional hosts are infected by malware while eradicating a malware incident, uh, then that, uh, of course, uh, spurs more activity. And then after the incident's adequately handled, uh, you know, you always want to have a report that kind of details the cost and cost of the incident and steps that uh, we should take to help prevent future incidents. So sticking with preparation, I mean, there's so many things you can be doing to be ready. Uh, Paramount's having all contact information readily available for uh, both the internal and external entities that are going to be uh, responding to an incident. Uh, having an issue tracking system for reporting, status, collaboration, uh, you know, maybe even having like a war room identified uh, to get all the stakeholders together, uh, tools like packet sniffers ready to deploy, uh, just being ready and prepared is key when getting ready to deal with an incident. So incidents occur in countless ways, like we talked about. We can't uh, develop those step-by-step -step instructions for every single one, but you should generally be prepared to handle any incident. Uh, but again, focusing on those common attack vectors uh, will get you a lot further than most organizations. So the most challenging part of the incident response process is you know, accurately detecting and assessing those possible incidents. So. Uh, determine whether an incident has actually occurred, if it's not just an event, and if it has, then the type, extent, and magnitude of the problem. So signs of an incident fall into one of two categories, uh, precursors and indicators. A precursor is a sign that an incident may occur in the future, and an indicator is a sign that an incident may have occurred or may be occurring now. So some of those sources and indicators that you have, uh, you know, you got alerts, so you got intrusion uh, detection and prevention systems that can throw alerts, uh, security information and event management systems, uh, your endpoint detection and response, antivirus, uh, you know, third party monitoring service. Uh, there are uh, white hat hackers out there that might, uh, you know, find a vulnerability and might let you know and just you can get alerts from a lot of different places. Uh, publicly available information, like again, some of the uh, you know, on Twitter, the news, whatever you see, uh, you know, the new latest uh, attack uh, that's out there and that's being utilized like Log4j, some of those under, other vulnerabilities when those start being uh, exposed out there in the wild, that can be a good good way for you to, to know that something, uh, you need to be looking for something. And then of course, people, again, people can be our best sensors within our organization knowing when something's not quite right. So documentation, uh, you know, you want to maintain records about the status of incidents along with any other pertinent information. So uh, using an application or database like an issue tracking system just helps ensure the incidents are handled 
uh, and resolved in a timely manner. And, you know, you should uh, contain or collect information on just to sum a, a little bit uh, of what's here on this slide. So like a summary of an incident, indicators related, who's potentially affecting, uh, any action taken, uh, contact information, and then uh, making sure that stuff is moving along in your response. So prioritizing is uh, of any incident, you know, this might be the most critical decision point in the incident handling process. So incidents definitely should not be handled on a first come first serve basis. Uh, there's resource limitations that everybody has. Um, you know, instead handling should be prioritized based on uh, some relevant factors. So again, going back to that risk, the, the functional impact of the incident. So incidents targeting IT systems, you know, those typically impact the business functionality, uh, you know, of users that result in some type of negative impact uh, to those uh, systems. Incident handlers should also consider, you know, how the incident will impact the existing functionality of the affected systems. Uh, you should consider not only the current functional impact, but the likely future functional impact uh, if it's not immediately contained. Um, the information impact of the incident. So that would be uh, things that affect, you know, the data or the information itself. Going back to the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, availability. So one example of that, uh, you know, a malicious actor may exfiltrate uh, sensitive company information or data. So you should consider how this information will impact the organization's overall mission. An incident that results in the exfiltration of sensitive info uh, that may also affect other organizations. If any other data pertain to a partner organization or to a citizen. Uh, recoverability of the incident, the size and the type of resources it affects will determine the amount of time and resources that must be spent on recovering from that incident. So some instances it's not possible to recover from an incident. So example of that would be uh, the confidentiality of sensitive information has been compromised. I'm sure everybody has gotten that letter from somewhere, uh, some company at some point saying their information was stolen. And once that's, once that's gone, it's gone. Uh, you're not going to recover from that. So it does not make sense to spend limited resources on an elongated incident handling cycle, unless, of course, that effort was directed ensuring a similar incident doesn't happen in the future. So in other cases, uh, incidents may require far more resources to handle than what an organization has available. So uh, you want to consider, you know, having those external entities ready to go and having that relationship beforehand. Uh, you just want to make sure and know what kind of effort you can put forth to actually recover and carefully weigh that against the value uh, recovery effort will create if you need that external help. Notification is important in communication. So when the incidents analyze and prioritize, the IR team needs to notify the appropriate individuals uh, so that all who need to be involved can play their roles and parts. Uh, incident response policies, plans, and procedures should include provisions concerning uh, this incident reporting. So at a minimum, uh, what must be reported to whom and at what times. Uh, for example, initial notification, regular status updates, and the like. And the exact reporting requirements will vary amongst organizations. Uh, parties that typically would be notified would include uh, like CEO, CIO, head of IT, head of information security, uh, anybody else that might be incident response teams, uh, the system owner, HR, public affairs, legal, uh, law enforcement. Next, we move on to uh, containment, eradication, and recovery. So containment's important before an incident overwhelms resources or increases damage. Uh, most incidents require containment, so it, that's definitely an important consideration early in the course of handling an incident. Containment provides time for developing that uh, tailored remediation strategy. So uh, the containment strategies varies based on the type of incident. Uh, for example, the strategy for containing an email-borne uh, malware infection is quite different than that from, say, a network-based DDoS attack. So you should have separate containment strategies for uh, some of those major incident types with criteria documented clearly uh, to help facilitate that decision-making and reduce the risk. 
potential damage to and theft of resources. So there's, uh, you know, you, you have a need for evidence preservation. Uh, service availability should be taken into account. Uh, for example, network connectivity, services provided to external parties, uh, time and resources needed to implement the strategy, uh, the effectiveness of the strategy, uh, the duration of the solution. So do you have emergency working around in place that can be removed in a set amount of time, uh, temporary workaround that can be removed, you know, and that's usually a little bit longer than that emergency workaround. So we're talking hours versus weeks and those two. And then after an incident has been contained, um, you know, if you're able to eradicate it, that may actually uh, be necessary uh, to limit uh, all the components of the incident. So deleting malware and disabling a breached user account, identifying and mitigating all vulnerabilities that were exploited at that time. Uh, so during eradication, again, it's important that you identify all effective hosts within the organization so that they can be remediated. Then as you move to recovery, administrators restore systems to normal operation, confirm everything's functioning normally, and then if applicable, remediate vulnerabilities uh, elsewhere to help prevent similar incidents. So recovery, uh, you know, you have those actions, restoring systems from clean backups, you know, you could have to rebuild everything from scratch, replace compromised files with clean versions, installing patches, changing passwords, uh, tightening some of those uh, tools you have, like your network perimeter security, so firewall rule sets, uh, access control lists, and the like uh, need to be tightened up as well in the recovery phase. And the last and probably one of the most important parts we move to uh, in the incident response uh, world is that post-incident activity. And of course, it's often the one that's the most omitted. So learning and improving from an incident. So uh, each incident response team should evolve to reflect new threats, improve technology, and especially lessons learned. So uh, some of the questions that you wanna to ask and make sure are answered uh, in this stage, exactly what happened and what times, how well did staff and management perform in dealing with the incident? Were the documented procedures followed? Are they adequate? Uh, what information was needed sooner? Were steps or actions taken that might have inhibited the recovery? Uh, what should we do differently next time a similar incident occurs? Uh, information sharing, uh, are there other organizations that uh, you know, might have uh, been able to help themselves uh, uh, keep themselves from being uh, affected by this incident if we would have information shared more. Uh, what corrective actions can prevent similar incidents in the future? Uh, what precursors or indicators should we watch for to detect similar incidents? And what additional tools or resources are needed, uh, you know, to help detect, analyze, and mitigate any future incidents? Uh, some of the collected data and metrics that you want to, to utilize, um, number of incidents, so handling more incidents, that's not necessarily better. Uh, for example, number of incidents handled may decrease because of network, better network and host security controls, uh, you know, not because of negligence by an incident response team, whether that's internal, internal or external. Um, so basically, the number of incidents, best taken as a measure, you know, relative amount of work, uh, that people had to perform, not as a measure of the quality, unless it's considered, you know, poten potentially in the context of other measures that uh, collectively give an indication of work quality. Uh, time per incident, uh, for each incident, time can be measured several ways. So uh, total amount of labor spent working on the incident, elapsed time from the beginning of the incident uh, to the incident discovery, to the initial impact assessment, and to each stage of the incident handling project or process, uh, how long it took to respond upon the initial report of the incident, how long it took to report to management or external entities, uh, the list kind of goes on and on. Uh, but basically, uh, mean time to detect, mean time to respond, meantime to recover, kind of the big three that you're looking at when you're assessing your incident response capability. All right, so now we are gonna jump over to, again, what we think is probably the most important part and what we really want you to take away from this uh, webinar today, and that is that incident response uh, 
sample plan and procedures that should uh, be out there for you guys to find on your LMS system. So um, I'm just going to walk through it really quick. Uh, kind of the areas highlighted are, uh, you know, where you'd want to fill in and change and tailor it to your organization. You can hack and slash as much of this, but again, if nothing else, if you just took uh, your organization's name and information specific to you guys and put it in the highlight areas, you can have a working incident response plan uh, very quickly. Uh, so um, basically, you just want uh, users or anybody to know if whoever discovers, you know, any kind of indicator of a cybersecurity incident will notify the notified entity. So, you know, as, as a library, you guys are usually city, you might have a city IT a function, you might have, uh, you know, an IT help desk, just basically somebody that needs to know that there's something potentially going on so they can start working through uh, the plan and procedure. So uh, that notify entity can kind of do that initial analysis. Um, you know, you want to start gathering as much information as possible as it relates to the uh, affected information system assets or information itself. So uh, some of the questions you want those people to ask, summarize the incident when it's discovered, any kind of uh, that technical information you can get. Uh, is there any kind of PII, uh, personally identif identifiable information or protected health information involved? Um, you know, how many potential individuals information is affected? Uh, and of course, is the breach ongoing? So then they kind of get into that quick uh, business impact analysis. Um, so usually that, uh, you know, that'll be kind of that quick decision if uh, that notified entity needs to uh, assign the incident to the security team. So um, once you get that security team kind of involved, they take a look, uh, they do what they do, use their systems, tools, do their analysis. And if it is determined to be an incident, then you do want to have, again, that full incident response team uh, ready to go. So. Uh, kind of sample uh, people involved. You'd have an incident commander. Uh, that could be, you know, your chief information security officer, your IT manager, uh, just somebody who uh, kind of knows the rope, ropes and knows what to do. You'll have people like your network administrators, firewall administrators, server administrators, desktop, application, cloud. Um, you know, that's really when you start to start getting into it. And then the security team, uh, you know, typically be that. Uh, uh, those keepers of that information. So uh, they should be able to get the severity level down and then uh, start following those response procedures uh, based on the assessment of the incident. So these are just uh, a couple examples. Again, we can't uh, plan for every single uh, security incident or threat uh, or uh, breach, but um, you know, what happens if there's a computer worm, ransomware, virus, uh, you know, phishing response, property theft, uh, getting a DDoS attack, uh, just having some of those kind of known what to do and some of, the, again, some of those uh, high risk factor or most common threat vectors uh, is definitely something that, that you want to put together. So uh, once you start working through, again, kind of the hand, handling stuff, um, you know, if you get to the point where you need an external organization to come in and help, uh, if you don't have, you know, maybe you don't have any IT folks at all, maybe you rely uh, completely on external parties as a managed service provider for all your technology, making sure that you have somebody uh, ready to go that knows your organization, that relationship is uh, pre-existing is definitely key. So. Uh, here in Iowa, there are a couple good cybersecurity companies, uh, ProCircular, uh, Pratum, uh, as well as, you know, maybe you got local people as well. But there are companies that, uh, you know, they'll do no cost type retainers where that you can learn, they can start learning a little bit about your organization and then be ready to jump in and help you having those contracts and those relationships up front will definitely pay a lot of help. And then, of course, uh, company leadership uh, being involved. Um, as well as, again, kind of the, some of those entities we talked about before, public affairs, legals, and all of those. So, uh, yep, you can hack and slash that. Um, go ahead and, uh, like I said, if you just fill in a little bit, 
Uh, you can go a long ways with having a, a fully ready incident response plan. And again, like I said, even if you don't have any of your own internal IT folks, uh, still knowing what to do and who to call when things pop up. Um, so, and then the very last uh, part of that is just kind of the, um, you know, uh, uh, sanitized it a little bit, but that's just kind of like a, a breach checklist, what, to, what we do here at the ICN uh, going down. Uh, who we need to have, uh, the kind of information that we want and want to collect, as well as who we need to notify, uh, both internal as well as local, and then out to the federal as well. So, and then of course, on the very, very last piece is that review and response and updating the policies, kind of that extra after action report that a lot of people skip. Making sure you do that is uh, very, very important. So, all right, well, we covered a heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully some of you have found something to take away. I actually went longer than I was expecting. I was hoping to keep it to half an hour, but uh, I think we are probably ready to jump to the question portion. Well, thank you. And I will just acknowledge that we had a lot of flurry in the chat around apparently a technical malfunction around attachments, which feels funny in a cybersecurity <laughs> webinar. Uh, because, of course, you are always trying to be very careful about attachments um, when uh, you're thinking in terms of cybersecurity. Um, but it appears at least some of us are having problems accessing the files in the learning management system, which we call Iowa Learns. And um, we will work to rectify that. I just put a ticket in with the help team on that front. Um, but in the meantime, they are in the chat here. If you scroll up, you should find them. Uh, and we'll make sure they get sent out by email as well. So um, we did have one question that came, or we have a couple questions that came in here at the end. And if other folks have questions, you are welcome to come off mute and ask those at this time, or we can use the chat to do that. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people in the room, but feel. I don't anticipate, you know, a ton of questions. Maybe we do. This is a lot of information to absorb for sure. So feel free to just come off mute and ask the question you have or, um, or put it in the chat. But one question we do have, how would we know the names of which systems are being targeted? And how do, would we get the IP address and location? Or would we have to have someone with, with more knowledge? So if it's your machine, um... You know, you can get that uh, if you got like Windows views and Windows machine, you can quickly go to like the control panel and system information. If it's something like on your network, um, you know, you're definitely going to want, you know, an IT person, whether you guys have uh, IT people that uh, you can work with or if you have a managed service provider, uh, you know, you usually get that kind of information. They should have that kind of stuff stored. Like I said, if you're in a Windows environment, Active Directory, uh, those types of things. If you're, uh, you know, firewalls, those types of things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not an IT administrator, yes, it's definitely gonna be hard harder for you to find that stuff uh, on the wider network. But again, if you're reporting your kind of stuff uh, up, and you're the user, then yes, I would definitely make sure you kind of know your machine name at least. Uh, we, here at the ICN, we put uh, labels with at least all of our machine names, and that's one of the first things we ask for, not only for security incident, but any kind of, uh, uh, you know, IT trouble or technical help that's needed for our users. Yeah. Um, Julia asked another question that I really like. Um, so this is a really good overview for, you know, institutions or libraries and such. Um, but if a patron were to call a library and say, I think I've had some sort of, you know, I've fallen victim to some sort of cybersecurity threat, um, what, what would you advise an individual to do in this situation? Or how could we have advise our patrons? Yes, I mean, unfortunately, you're going to want to send them to law enforcement, um, who may or may not help them. Uh, yes, unfortunately, that's that's just the way it is. The uh, uh, the FBI has a uh, reporting mechanism called the Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3. Uh, uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, I think. Uh, will handle uh, kind of those consumer type uh, reports as well. 
and again, I can send uh, I can send answers with more information on that kind of stuff as well. It might be easier that way than typing it all, putting it all in the chat. I'm also going to put, what I will put in the chat is we did a webinar with um, a regional person from the FTC um, called Signs of a Scam. And there's a link to that webinar on YouTube, but in it, she talked about uh, the subtitle of it being keep your patrons and yourself safe from online fraudsters. And she talked about some FTC resources on that topic. Um, and I think we did that last maybe August or something. It was last year sometime. So um, there you go. That's probably a better answer than I will ever be able to give. So yeah, it, it's a great <laughs> webinar. She's extremely helpful. Um, Carol. Oh, what is her last name? Carol Kondo Pineda. Um, I believe is how you say it, but um, I think she might be based in Chicago question mark or Minneapolis, one of the bigger, bigger, not Des Moines cities in the U.S. here. Um, and I, I like this advice from Louise in the chat, and I'll read it out for the recording. We have labels on all city and patron machines, and she keeps a master list ne next to her desk. Um, she puts in a lot of the help desk tickets, and they always want to know the PC number. So that's a really helpful piece of information to have if you ever have an issue with a certain machine. Um, and there's a, there was a comment that came through, and I wonder if you can speak to this, but sort of a lot of what you're kind of saying, it seems like, is recognize when it's an issue that is going to need professional help and support, mm -hmm. and when it's something you want to tackle. Do you want to speak to that delineation a little bit? Yeah. I mean, if it's, uh, you know, say, uh, you know, you got like, a virus or something or your IT team has, you know, they got an endpoint detection response or some kind of endpoint protection and they get, uh, you know, something pops up that, you know, somebody tries to download this malware, may have downloaded this malware. Um, you know, usually those things will block things themselves. Most of those uh, endpoint and network security tools have gotten to the points where they can block themselves. So, uh, you know, there's really not that much you need to do at that point. Uh, the more you can auto block, the better. Uh, it can kind of impact the user experience. Uh, you know, sometimes there are false positives and things will get blocked that shouldn't. But, um, you know, the more you can do that, then the less obviously incidents you'll have. Uh, you know, I would say the delineation is, is you know, if, if you're, um, you know, you, you know, you got ransomware and, you know, somebody got on their machine and, you know, you get a call saying they've been locked out and then you start noticing that, you know, it's gone to, you know, a file share or, you know, it's gone elsewhere in the network. That's definitely, you know, uh, I would say here at the ICN, uh, we do have a contract uh, with one of those outside companies. Um, you know, that would probably be the point that we're just when it gets to a scale that we know that it's more than you know, a machine or two or a server, or, you know, you know, just when, when you know that, uh, yeah, the, the threat is there to, you know, basically bring business to a halt. That's, you know, that's definitely when we're going to call for outside help, but we're always going to try to tr try to do it ourselves first. And usually on a lot of those smaller things, we, we definitely do. So we have a lot of libraries in Iowa, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, given your work around the state, but that are extremely small, you know, one, one to two staff people, their city may or may not have an IT person on staff. And so they do a lot of stuff in house. So what would your, I don't know, top one or two pieces of advice be to a library in that situation? Um, in terms of maybe prevention or like a next action coming out of this webinar? Yeah. So make sure that uh, uh, if you don't have or even well, if you don't or you, if you do have any kind of centralized management of any of these IT assets, make sure that automatic updates for everything are turned on. Uh, so you're talking the operating systems, applications, uh, any of those kinds of things, uh, you know, make sure all your devices are just set to auto update. So you're not having to manually do that or having to worry about that. Um, and then um, boy you know the the other thing i would recommend is again having that kind of endpoint detection and response program out there you know that's used to be called antivirus uh, but again they've evolved considerably to where they do so much more 
um, you know, that can help you with your inventory that can help you again, kind of proactively and automatically, you know, block any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of those threats and risks that are out there. Oh, absolutely. Um, here's a good question kind of on that front. So, and <laughs> it's been a long time since I've used something like an, a Norton or an Avast kind of thing. And you can Google, you know, you're going to hit that Google for, you know, those endpoint protection companies and get thousands, I'm sure, of different results. But how do we balance the need for protection with the need for free access that comes with the mission of a public library? Ooh. And maybe maybe you're not the best person to tackle that. I do know we have a couple of state library people in the room. Maybe they want to speak with that. But maybe uh, from a protection standpoint, uh, what what would you say? Um, you know, the, you're going to do that. You know, you can do some of that again with the endpoint detection response. But you know, there are like uh, you know URL content filtering type things or firewalls. Um, you know, those kinds of things where you can kind of block those broad categories very easily. Uh, so obviously, um, boy, I mean, there, there's some categories you can, you know, are no brainers, but some of them that definitely, uh, you know, I think you, yeah, that's a tough spot for you guys to be in for sure. <laughs> Jay or Eunice, I'll put you on the spot. These are two of our district consultants. Anything either of you would chime in on that front with? And I know Louise uh, in West Des Moines as well has been a longtime IT manager in that in that city. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to someone with more expertise on the public front than myself to maybe chime in. Anything any of you guys want to add? Oh, they're being quiet. Maybe they don't have permission to unmute. Uh, Actually, oh, I like Jay. Louise's response. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> We're talking at the same time now. Eunice, go ahead, and then we'll switch to Jay. Uh, Louise mentioned her response about using uh, deep freeze on the public machines, but they keep one that doesn't get wiped right away because sometimes patrons need to save stuff. Um, you know, they're looking at that, but you still need to clean it periodically. But give them a certain amount of semi-locked down ability where it's needed. I know deep freeze and that type of thing has been very well used around the state for uh, being able to let patrons use computers and then get them back to the way they were after they've used them. Hey, it's Louise. Hey, Louise. Hold my mic down. Sorry. Sure. Um, yeah, we. This has been a really long time thing, and in fact, I think I wrote a book in like 2003 where I reviewed all this kind of stuff. You know, the time and print management, and whatever. And it's it's just a. I would say it's a tough thing, but it's if you have an actual IT provider or even you know a company that you contract with to help you with this stuff talk about the different layers because there is the layer of we just got to keep the really bad stuff out which ryan was talking about of you know basic you know keeping things things that are on um blacklists and whitelists and all of that has to be sorted out in a firewall but then there's also the day-to-day -day things like patrons need to save stuff to a usb so you can't disable saving to a usb which is one way that some corporations for instance protect everything by just not letting you use USBs at all. Well, that's not practical in a library environment because um, that's how patrons come in with stuff. Do um, you restrict then, uh, this is Rebecca's question, would you, mm -hmm. do you restrict what kinds of USBs or like, do they have to buy it from the library or? No, we, know, try, like we tried that at one ring, point. Yeah. That did not work. Um, yeah. The, the reality is the machine itself has a fair bit of software it has, I think they're using CrowdStrike uh, with the city. I can't remember because the patron machines have a slightly different thing than than our staff machines do. But basically, they've built layers of things, um, starting with like, you know, Windows um, registry stuff with, um, you know, the basic Windows, Windows Defender with Deep Freeze. Deep Freeze actually does quite a lot to help because even if something's put on it, then at Reboot, which again, since we use EnvisionWare for our time time management, 
every time they end a session, it, the whole thing gets rebooted. And so deep freeze is then activated. We occasionally have a problem where it's rebooting and deep freeze isn't activated and it has to be re-rebooted, re but for the most part, it works pretty slick. Um, this is over years and years and years of of different layers and different products and figuring out like how to make windows and deep freeze talk to each other and all of that. So there is a, but there's a lot of really good information out there about how to build a PC and have these basic protections. Cause we also have the city's firewall. We also have, um, we don't, we do very minimal filtering on the patron side and it's a different level of filtering on the staff network. And those are two now separate networks. They used to be, mm -hmm. VLAN, they're now completely separate providers. And that actually has yeah. given us a lot more power. Um, so this is a I rabbit can, hole we could spend, I mean, yeah. obviously, like but months. I, I guess the discussing. way to think about it is the layers of like, okay, yeah. there's the, there's the, are they saving to the desktop and therefore everyone can see it who sits down at that machine. You need to make sure that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Is it, you save at a place because you need to save a place, but you clear it out regularly. Okay. That's that kind of privacy from patron to patron privacy is something we don't always think about too, of mm -hmm. making sure that this person's resume with their home address on it can't be seen by this person. So they get stalked. Yeah, exactly. An excellent point. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, yeah, maybe to close, I'll just kind of say that, uh, you know, you might think like that won't happen here as far as some of the like the ransomware who would hold my little library's IT <laughs> at ransom. But I think Ryan would probably say you never know when it's going to happen and it's better to be safe than sorry. Unless, uh, are you familiar with any libraries being specifically targeted or um, cities? I know there are larger cities that have had that issue and school districts for sure. Um, I don't see why a library wouldn't. There are definitely, uh, I can think of one or two in the state, yes, libraries. Okay, so it could happen to you. Well, we are coming to the top of the hour. Um, oh, and Susan points out, okay, so in Iowa, so let me go through the chat here sort of in, <laughs> in order. Um, and again, this is not an issue we spent a ton of time on here, but the staff computers versus the public computers, you may need to have different approaches. And um, someone in Olwine pointing out that, you know, the staff could actually be the bigger problem if they have, uh, you know, less of a deep freeze situation or less of a security situation on the staff computers. Um, and then Iowa Falls pointing out that they were held at for ransom about three years ago. So um, an ongoing issue and certainly one to take very seriously. If there are, uh, oh, would you have some things you'd like to say in closing here? Yeah, just Bring one more out? thing, if yeah. you don't mind, before closing out. So I just want to highlight uh, a great program that we have here at the ICN that uh, our marketing uh, lead, Lori Larson, runs and does terrific with. So it's called the Statewide Youth Broadband Advisory Council. Uh, so once a month, we have high school students get together virtually. And then once a year, we get them together in person down here at the Capitol. Uh, so we do uh, mostly discuss technology, but we also uh, receive security training and get a security certification from Fortinet. Uh, we tour technology facilities like this year. We took them to the Light Edge Data Center over in Altoona. Um, hear from Iowa tech industry leaders uh, again that monthly and then get to mingle with elected and government officials here at the Capitol that one time a year. So if you know any uh, tech loving high school students, uh, please uh, send them our way. We'd love to have them participate next year. What a great program. Um, well, we're at the top of the hour, and I say a huge thank you to Ryan Mulhall and to Lori Larson, who I did see in the um, who I did see in the uh, participants list as well. You can see Ryan's contact information on the screen there, and you know how to get a hold of the state library. But best of luck to you all. Do um, look for those resources and I will learn if we can get that up and running and I will make sure that those get sent out over email as well so that um, everyone can access if we are having issues with the I will learn. So um, thanks again, Ryan, and thanks everyone for coming. Yes, thank you, Sam, for having us and putting it together. Thank you. Bye.